In this video, we're going to deal with the cash, the internal controls, and the bank reconciliation. How a company handles their cash and how they make sure to control that. So first of all, we're going to spend some time talking about internal controls themselves. Why does a company need internal controls? What is the benefit of having an internal control system? With internal controls, managers are able to use policies and procedures to do a few things. First of all, protect their assets. So they want to make sure nothing gets stolen. Second of all, ensure reliable accounting. We want to make sure what we're recording on the financial statements is accurate. That's actually what we do have. If some cash was stolen and we didn't know about it, then the amount we're reporting is not technically correct. Even though maybe we didn't intend to lie about the amount, the fact that what we reported really isn't there, that's not reliable. Promote efficient operations. If we have to continually buy new equipment or buy new inventory because people keep stealing it, stealing it, that's obviously not very efficient. Number four, urge adherence to company policies. The fact that we have internal controls in place hopefully will make sure that other people actually follow those rules. Just having a system in place is a control in itself. It's a deterrent to theft and fraud. So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, although this is not a focus of this particular chapter, this is an important one because it did strengthen the internal control requirements for companies. A lot of different things, they're now required to evaluate their internal controls on an annual basis. There's a lot of oversight of the auditor's work by a new board, the PCAOB. They now, have, they now promulgate new rules for auditors to follow. And one of them, again, is the review of the internal control, both on the accounting side and the auditing side. There are other things that come into play. Uh, auditors can no longer pr uh, provide consulting services in addition to that auditing service. Term limits on person leading the audit. So you can't have the same audit leader, audit manager, in that position with that one company for several years. They may get too comfortable with that company. And there are a lot of penalties that are in place now that weren't before. So let's talk about some principles of internal control. What things do we actually need to do? What are the underlying principles of internal control? Number one, we want to establish responsibilities. So we want to make sure everybody is aware of their responsibility. And that way, if something does go wrong, we know who to go back to to find out why it happened. Maintain, maintain adequate records. If we don't have records in place, we can't prove that anything actually happened to begin with. If we have good records, we can trace it back to figure out where things went wrong. Insure assets and bond key employees. So if you have an asset that you're concerned about losing, insure it. First of all, that's a good control. If it's insured, then obviously you'll get your you'll be able to purchase one again as a replacement. And furthermore, if the insurance company is involved, there's likely to be a, a, an investigation there. They're not just going to say, oh, here's your money, go ahead and take it. They're, they want to know what happened as well. Bond key employees. Bonding here, the t way this term is used, isn't in type of insurance. It's an insurance against that particular employee committing fraud or stealing your money. To be an employee that works with cash, let's say they're maybe at a casino in a, in a custodial role where you actually physically have the cash, or maybe an armored car driver, armored truck driver, you're going to have to have bonding, which means that they do a background check and they make sure you haven't committed fraud before, first of all. Number four, separate record keeping from custody of assets. There's actually another one that goes in here. We want to separate three things. Accounting, or no, I'm sorry, authorization is the A, record keeping, and then custody of assets. What we're basically saying is we don't want someone in the position to do two or more of those things. If someone has custody of assets, for example, we want to make sure they also don't have record keeping. If they did, if they had both of these duties, they could steal an asset because they physically have custody of it, and they could cover it up in the books. So we want to make sure that if someone has custody of an asset, physical custody, Yes, they can steal it, but we want to make sure they can't hide it as well, because then we can find out what happened and go after them. Number five, divide responsibility for related transactions. 
separate the duties. That really relates back to number four, but this also provides a double check. Number six, apply technological controls. This could be something as simple as a password on a computer, or it could also be a, a cash register that keeps track of the sales, the voids, all of that. Number seven, perform regular and independent reviews. This is an audit, whether it be an internal audit or an external audit. The fact that you have these reviews, first of all, helps to make sure that if something does happen, it'll be caught quickly. Second of all, the fact that the reviews are in place should help to defer, uh, deter people from actually committing the fraud in the, f in the first place. Technology. Let's talk about how that affects internal controls. The good news is that it should reduce processing errors. So we're saying that if you have to do everything manually by book, by hand, then there's a likelihood that you're going to just simply make a mathematical error that will maybe carry through to several other computations. Computers don't make mathematical errors. If they make an error, it's because it was programmed wrong, and that would mean the entire thing is wrong. It's not just going to be an error with one calculation. It's going to be an error throughout every time that calculation exists. So it'll reduce processing errors. Uh, one bad thing is that there's limited evidence of processing. So if we're trying to audit this, it's not as easy to find the evidence of the processing. You have to have someone with experience in the system to go in and dig for it. The system does all that stuff at once, so it doesn't need to keep an, a written audit trail. Increased e-commerce. This is a big benefit. Uh, we're talking about the internet here. We're talking about uh, electronic funds transfer, EFT. This makes it easier to both sell a product to multiple customers, regardless of geographic location, and it also makes it easier to collect on that or transfer the funds. Crucial separation of duties. Uh, a couple things here. We could have the separation of duties more easily because we can restrict things via password. That's kind of what we're talking about here. But also, this could be a downside because we do have technology in place. We may not need to have all those individual people since the computers are doing a lot more of the jobs. The unfortunate part is that means we may not have as many people there, and we may not have enough people to separate those duties out. The big benefit here is the more extensive testing of records. It's easier to test a technology-based system because you don't have to manually flip through paper. You can go through a computer record, a spreadsheet, a database, and test whatever you wanted to test. You can do it a lot more easily. So because of that, because it's easier, more it's quicker, you can uh, test more. It takes less time per unit per test, so you can test more with the same amount of time. We do have some limitations of internal control. First of all, human error. This just means someone made a mistake. They didn't intend to. They just made a mistake. Could be negligence. They just weren't really paying attention. Fatigue. They're overworked. They're tired. Misjudgment. They just used bad judgment. They tried their hardest, and they just made a bad call. Or confusion. They just simply didn't understand it. They tried, but they really just didn't understand what was going on. Human error can be corrected by training. If it's overworked, then maybe you have to split the duty up a few more times, but it can be handled. Human fraud, this is the unfortunate one. This is where someone intentionally tries to defeat the internal control for their own gain. They are intending to make mistakes and hide those mistakes so that they can get away with theft. That one's really, you can't, the only way to uh, avoid that is to stop it right away get rid of the person. If someone is intending to commit fraud, it's hard. It's not a, not a matter of training necessarily. It's just a matter that this person is willing to commit fraud to steal money from us. They are going to do whatever they can to steal that money. They think they have a reason to do it. They think they can justify it. We don't want a person like that in our company. We can put all the internals or all the internal controls in place that we wanted. The thing is, we want to make sure that we're not spending so much on those internal controls that they outweigh their benefits. For example, if we are trying to protect $10,000 in cash, it doesn't make sense to go spend a million dollars on a safe 
and all this other equipment, surveillance equipment, armed guards. It doesn't make sense to spend a million dollars to protect $10,000. That's a quick example of that. So now we're going to spend the rest of this section talking about cash specifically. So how do internal controls relate to cash? A couple of things coming into play here. We want to make sure the cash is separate. The, the cash custody, the handling of the cash, is separate from the record keeping of the cash. So again, if someone has physical access to cash, that's fine, but we want to make sure they also can't update the records. If they could, then they could possibly steal this asset, steal this cash, and then cover it up in the books. Cash disbursements should be made by check whenever possible. We have an immediate receipt. It has authorization. Cash receipts are promptly deposited in a bank. We don't want to have a whole lot of cash on hand. Putting them in the bank creates an audit trail, and the cash is then protected by the bank. So the first thing we need to know is, what are we talking about with cash when we use that term? We're not just talking about the dollar bills, which is what you first think of with cash. We are talking about currency, the dollar bills. We're talking about coins. We're talking about any amounts in our bank accounts, because that's cash. We can go get it immediately. And it also includes anything that we may have in our cash register that day. Customer checks, cashier checks, certified checks, money orders. Those are all things that we have. We can convert them to cash very quickly. There's another term called cash equivalents. These are short-term, highly liquid investments that are readily convertible to a known cash amount. In other words, very short term, less than three months generally, we can convert them to a specific cash amount with very little risk that the amount will change. Very little risk that the interest rates are going to change and change that amount overall. Liquidity. When we use that term, we're talking about how quickly can an asset be converted to cash or used up. So inventory, for example, hopefully we use that up pretty quickly. We want to sell it. Cash, obviously, is already liquid. It's 100% liquid. It's already cash. So now we're going to move on to cash management principles. So when a company fails, it's saying a lot of times it's just simply due to the fact that they can't manage their cash properly. Either they, they can't collect their cash quickly enough, or they maybe spend too much cash right away. They don't plan their payments. So for whatever reason, they can't keep the minimum level of cash necessary to operate. We have a few different things that would come into play. We have two different types of cash receipts, two different main types. We have over-the-counter cash receipts. One way to control this is by having a cash register with a locked-in record of transactions so nobody can go in there and change the records without, it, without the void, for example, being recorded itself. At the end of the night, for example, we'll compare the cash register record with the cash we actually have on hand. So let's say we start the day off with $200 in cash. We have $800 of sales. We would expect to have $1,000 cash at the end of the night. If we can't count $1,000, if we don't actually have $1,000, then there's a big issue. Cash receipts by mail. The way we may want to control those is by, first of all, having two people open the mail. One of them is going to have physical custody of the cash. They'll take the money to the cashier's office. The other person is going to be involved with the record keeping. They take a list to the accounting department, and the copy of that list should be filed for audit down the road. This way, if that one person does steal the cash when they physically had it, they'll catch it right away because the accounting department will see it. They'll see the list, and they'll eventually realize that, hey, we know there should be cash, but there's not cash on hand. That cash never made it to us.